Bipolar affective disorder, commonly known as manic depression, is one of the commonest and most severe psychiatric illnesses, affecting 1 in 50 people. Unfortunately, there is no diagnostic test for bipolar, so it's a clinical diagnosis, meaning it's diagnosed based on the patient's signs and symptoms. Individuals with bipolar affective disorder typically have separate episodes of mania or hypomania and depression. The ICD-10 diagnostic criteria states that for a diagnosis to be made, someone must have two episodes of disturbed mood, with at least one being mania or hypomania. To understand what mania and depression are, it's useful to think of our mood as always being part of a spectrum, with mania being the most elevated mood, and major depression being the lowest. Mood refers to a person's emotional state at a particular point in time. Most people experience a range of emotions, and therefore moods, which will fluctuate between above and below euthymia. Bipolar affective disorder means an individual experiences a greater range of moods, reaching the extreme of both ends of the spectrum. A less extreme disorder is cyclothymia, which happens when the mood fluctuates outside of the typical range, but doesn't reach mania or major depression. Let's have a deeper look at what it's like to experience these mood states. To be categorised as mania, the emotional state has to last for at least seven days and impair social functioning. In other words, the individual is not able to perform their usual daily activities. During mania, the mood is elevated, with people often describing euphoria. They can also experience increased energy, increased self-esteem, and decreased attention. It's also typical to develop risky behaviours because of these symptoms. For example, gambling, or being more sexually promiscuous. You can also experience delusions, where you will develop unshakable beliefs in things that are not true. In mania, these are often delusions of grandeur, where someone believes that they are of much greater importance than others. For example, like a god, or having special powers. Hypomania is a less extreme version of elevated mood, which lasts for at least four days, but does not impair normal social function. Someone will still experience the same symptoms, but to a lesser severity. Another difference is that it does not include psychotic features, like delusions. Depression is the other end of the mood spectrum and lasts 14 days or more to meet the diagnostic criteria. Like mania, it too will impair social functioning. However, unlike mania, it's associated with decreased mood and decreased energy. People can also experience anhedonia, where they receive no pleasure from things that would usually bring them joy, like hobbies or socialising. Sleep disturbance, appetite change and weight change, along with suicidality, are also features of depression. It's also important to remember that both mania and depression can result in psychosis, with symptoms of hallucinations, delusions and thought disorder. Before we move on, I want to highlight the importance of performing a risk assessment for patients with mental health difficulties. It's essential to assess risk of any patient presenting with psychiatric illness. Patients can be a risk to themselves, pose a risk to others, and be vulnerable of risk from others. So, taking a psychiatric history should therefore always include questions around these three headings. So, what causes bipolar? Well, like most other mental illness, the pathophysiology is not completely understood, but there are two main theories. Theory 1 is thought to be a problem with the synapses in the brain, where neurotransmitters that transport signals from one neuron to another are dysfunctional. The second theory is hormonal dysfunction, where there's a problem with the hypothalamus signalling to the pituitary gland, or with the pituitary gland signalling downstream to the adrenal glands. Bipolar affective disorder affects 1 in 50 people and has strong genetic links, meaning it can be hereditary. In fact, a child of a parent with bipolar affective disorder has a 50% chance of developing some sort of psychiatric illness. Management of any psychiatric condition should focus on biological, psychological and social therapies. 
Biological management mostly involves medications. Mood stabilizers, such as lithium, are important drugs to take long term to help prevent someone's mood from fluctuating to the extreme ends of the spectrum. Lithium levels in the blood are monitored regularly since it has a narrow therapeutic window and if levels are too high, it can become toxic. It's particularly toxic to the kidneys, thyroid glands and heart. Antipsychotics like olanzapine and antiepileptics like sodium valproate are useful for managing acute episodes of mania or depression. This is because they work faster than lithium. The use of antidepressants in depressive episodes of bipolar is often avoided since there's a risk of pushing mood to the other end of the spectrum, causing mania. It's also important to note that sodium valproate should be avoided in women of childbearing age due to its teratogenic effects. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is recommended by NICE for the treatment of mania when it's severe and either life-threatening or resistant to medical treatment. Psychological therapies are also important when managing bipolar. These include talking therapies, often between a patient and a psychologist. CBT, psychoeducation and counselling are all used to support individuals with bipolar affective disorder. Social support is also important, for example, encouraging engagement with social activities and exercise, or supporting people to return to work after episodes of leave from illness. Thanks for watching, and feel free to check out my other videos on psychiatry.